Hello, everybody. My name is Ronald Paredes, um, and I am with Outside Power. Uh, this is part three of our uh, webinar series. Uh, we went through part one, um, part two, and this is part three. Part one gives a basic introduction to our products, uh, our inverters, charge controllers, minor boxes, how they work, the limitations, the advantages. Part two goes in went into uh, sizing. Uh, the factors that we need to consider after sizing a system, and part three will involve two things. Uh, we're going to do a sizing um, exercise, and we're going to go into more depth with our products, uh, the real advantages that battery-based uh, systems offer, um, in addition to uh, the backup power that they, of course, provide uh, when, there's, when the power when the grid fails. So with that, we're going to get going. Um, this is uh, just a contact slide. Uh, I'll, I'll post this at the end, so don't worry about uh, having to uh, write down uh, these numbers here. So, that's an example. So, for and this is actually a system that I worked on with a customer some time ago. Um, so, the, the profile of the system is that he had an average load of 2,000 watts at 120 volts AC. The combined surge. The, the inbrush, the transient currents, they added up to 4,000 watts. The runtime of this specific application was six hours, and they were using a, a battery um, bank of uh, 48 volt, uh, uh, nominal voltage. The temperature range was minus 2C to plus uh, 35C, or 28.4F to 110F. The peak sun hours was 5.5. The autonomy that they needed was two days, and the design margin or the system growth, um, the system was going to grow by 10%. The target DOD, the desired DOD, was 50%. So this is again something we've looked at in the past, but just to uh, just you know help us uh, keep in mind that we need to take into account the. Uh, system and efficiencies as we go through our sizing uh, uh, exercise here. So we start with the inverter. Now, the inverter has to handle uh, the 2,000 watts plus the combined surge. Now, here we see, uh, in this case, we, we chose the, uh, the VFX as 3648. So here we see that it has a 48 volt input. The power handling capability is uh, 3.6 kVA. And it has a mouth current of 30 amps. Now, if we come down here where it says AC overload capability, we see that there are three ratings again search, five seconds, and 30 minutes uh, uh, overload uh, ratings. And again, the search is for 100 milliseconds or less. The five second is really what we want to use to size um, an inverter because that's what most inductive uh, loads like motors, for example, will somewhat settle to their two load amps after about five seconds. We wouldn't want to use the search, for example, because it's not going to be enough time. Um, the uh, 30 minutes is something that we can use, provided that we understand that the, the, inverter, can, the inverter cannot put out 4,000 VH, in this case, continuously. Uh, the way to read this is basically that after 30 minutes, with an overload of 4,000 VAs, the inverter will fall down. So here we see that we have two loads. We have uh, the actual load and then, of course, the, uh, the efficiencies of the wiring. And that's actually what the inverter is looking at. But with a, a load of 22.2 uh, to 6.5, uh, that's well within the uh, power handling capabilities of the inverter. And again, the inverter. With inverter, we deal with power, and with PV and batteries, we deal with energy. So uh, just to remind us, again, that uh, the pass-through current here, again, uh, the AC input current is 60 amps, but the export current is 30 amps here. And this, we talked about this in part two, but just to keep us, just refresh our mind here. So uh, that's really all we need to know, we need to do uh, as far as the, the inverter for now. Now, again, just uh, if we go back to the uh, profile here, we see that it's a 2,000 watt load at 120 VHP. And each of the inverters provides 
I want to negotiate. So, so we are okay on the voltage side, on the frequency side, and on the power handling side. For the battery. So now we need to know what battery uh, we need to use for this system. And basically, we said uh, in part two that what we need to ask ourselves is we need to ask ourselves, if I was a battery, what is the load that I'm seeing? And to determine that, we need to take into account three losses, the distributor, the, uh, the wire between the inverter and, and the load, in other words, distri distribution wiring, the inverter's inefficiency, and the, the uh, losses between the batteries and the inverters. So here we have some nominal uh, numbers, basically 0 0.98, 90 percent, 90 percent, and 98 percent. So if we take the 2,000 watts and divide it by the product of 0.98 times 0.9 times 0.98, it gives us 23, 25.58, and that's the actual load that batteries are seeing. Now, uh, that's going to uh, tell, take us very nicely to our discharge current, the battery current, and from that we can see that if we divide the 23 uh, to 5.58 by 48, and I'm only using nominal values here, it gives us uh, 48.45 amps. Now, once we come up, we come to this point, we look back at the system profile and, and look at the run time. And here we saw that the running time was going to be six hours. Now, 48.45 amps times six hours gives us uh, 290.7 amp hours. And that is what is called the unadjusted capacity. In other words, the actual energy coming out of the batteries is 290.7 amp hours. What we need to do now is we need to adjust the capacity by taking into account things like temperature, the dates of autonomy, the end of life capacity, um, the design margin, and the depth of discharge. So this is where it becomes important to know and ask those questions to the customer. Um, and so in this case, we saw that we were going to uh, have two dates of autonomy uh, minus uh, 22C or 28.4F, 20, uh, um, and uh, we don't want to exceed uh, the uh, depth of discharge, a DOD of uh, 0 0.5. And so basically what we do is we just follow this equation here. So the AH, so that's basically our unadjusted amp hour capacity that the system, that the load requires, times the temperature adjustment, which at uh, minus to see a 28.4 uh, F that happens to be 1.22. We need two days of autonomy. Um, and the system is going to grow by 10%. So we add 110% here. Now, I didn't include the uh, end of life capacity. And the reason I didn't do that was because we're using VRLA batteries here. Uh, and for this, uh, for this uh, specific exercise, I chose the Unity 2 battery. Uh, which is an AGM battery, and, uh, and our uh, controlled DOD is 0.5. Now, the only thing I'll say about DOD is that there is what is called a maximum DOD and a daily DOD. Now, you can choose to control the DOD through the autonomy period, which is exactly what we're doing here. What we're doing here is we're saying basically, even if we go through our two days of autonomy and we are at um, the coldest or the lowest expected temperature. In other words, the worst possible conditions, we still don't want to exceed 50% EOD. So that's what we're saying here. Now, if we don't, if we want to be uh, basically at 100% EOD at the end of the autonomy period, then we don't need to put the EOD here uh, at the bottom. So uh, the adjusted capacity with a controlled EOD is 1560.47 uh, amp hours. So here we went from 290.7 to 15.6, uh, I'm sorry, to 1560 amp hours. Quite the difference there. But we accounted for temperature, space of autonomy, time uh, for system growth, and we are limiting the depth of discharge down to 50%, even at
eight and four five, I'm, I'm, we see that uh, with a load of 48.45 amps, that this is going to run basically 12.28 hours. So we are going to have a run time of 12.28 hours, and keeping in mind that our runtime, uh, the runtime of the actual load is going to be uh, six hours. So again, uh, here's a table for the adjusting factors for the temperature and the rate of autonomy that can be anywhere between two to ten. Now, the only thing I'll just say, and we'll, we'll go back to the batteries right now, but the only thing I'll say about the rate of autonomy is that standalone systems uh, should have about five days if they need to be available 99%, meaning that uh, if it's a critical system, then we're going to have to increase our days of autonomy, of course. So unless it's a hybrid, if it's a hybrid and you have uh, a generator that can supply uh, some of the energy when uh, when the main sources uh, are not available, then that will change the days of autonomy. There is a handbook by uh, Sandia uh, Lab that relate the base of autonomy to fifteen hours and so um, it's a nice way to determine that. But going back to our, our, our batteries here, we see that the um, functional hour rate, in other words, this rate that uh, at forty four five amps times uh, twelve point two eight hours, that gives us a functional hour rate of forty eight point four five times twelve point two eight hours gives us five ninety five point five eight amp hours. Now, we have basically three different amp hours here. We see that Uh, you know, being a Murphyus, uh, the worst possible conditions, and then the functional hour rate is what the battery will actually deliver if we place uh, a load of uh, 48 and 25 amps. So now we need to, with this information, we can now calculate the uh, the number of strings we're going to need, and that's simply the ratio of the adjusted capacity by the functional uh, capacity, the both in amp hours, and that gives us. Uh, 262 strings. Uh, we can at this point go down to two strings or we can go to three strings. Um, of course, if we go down to two strings, then we're going to be discharging the batteries a little bit more. Our depth of discharge is going to be a, a, a game of um, basically economic, but this is basically how you'd want to do that. So the steps are very simple. Uh, we really just want to know what load the battery is in. We want to know exactly how long the battery is going to run at that specific pairing. Um, and from there, we want to know, we want to adjust the capacity, taking the appropriate factors into account. Uh, and we also want to know what the functional hour rate will be at that uh, discharge current. Now, very important to, to realize here is that uh, the 2,000 watts, that is the running uh, load on the batteries. In other words, we took into account the in how the loads are interrelated in the system. Uh, we didn't just say, um, notice that here I didn't use I didn't use energy uh, like a lot of people do. They just add up um, the wattage times the running time, and they come up come up with uh, kilowatt hours, and then from there they uh, convert that to amp hours and they use the data power number to choose a battery. That's going to lead to uh, some problems. You really want to know uh, exactly what is the current that's discharging the batteries because that's again going to be uh, the 100 hour rate of our uh, energy to uh, energy 200 RE cell for example is 200 amp hours uh, if we discharge it at 2 amps. If uh, we, if we discharge it at 8.9 at amps, it gives us 178 uh, amp hours, and at 29.5 point, roughly a little over 29 amps, it gives us about five hours of runtime. So 
the actual discharge energy that battery is going to give us, and that's the reason we want to use the functional hour rate instead of nominal 120 or 5 hour rate uh, to be okay to be on uh, to precise. So onto a onto a charge controller first, and this is we we went through a lot of this uh, in part two, but basically what we need to know now or what we need to do is we need to make sure that we recharge the batteries uh, once we begin to use them. And so here I chose a percent overcharge of 115%. Uh, percent. So basically we take our unadjusted capacity in amp hours, which was 290.7 uh, amp hours, and we multiply the amp hours times the voltage, and that converts us to, uh, to, to the watt hours. So here we have uh, 13,953 watt hours. We need to put that into the batteries uh, roughly 115%. So 13,953.6 uh, times 1.15 gives us our 16,446.6 uh, 16, uh, watt hours. Now, that's what needs to go into the batteries. And again, we need, that, we need to do that because batteries are not 100% efficient and they do need a little overcharge uh, to uh, bring them back to, uh, um, to an SOC to a set of charge of 100%. So that's critical to do. Um, next is how many watt hours we need to produce in order to put those uh, 16,046.6 uh, watt hours into the batteries. And for that, we need to take into account three losses. The wiring between the PV array and the controller, the controllers, the charge controller's losses, and then the wiring uh, between the charge controller and the batteries. And if we do that uh, in this equation here, we see that what we actually need to put out uh, what the array needs to put out is 17,136 watt hours. Now, once we do that, now comes the peaks and hours into account uh, because that's going to help us uh, size the array. Now, if we take the 17,136.6 uh, divided by the peaks and hours, it gives us an array wattage of uh, three one, uh, a little over 3,115 uh, 3, uh, 0.75 watts. Now, because nothing is efficient, there's no, no, no such thing as a, 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 a system that has an efficiency of, a, a, of 1 or 100 percent, we need to uh, take into account that as well. So that gives us, uh, if we take up 0.8, uh, you hear different people use different numbers, 0.75, 0.77, 0.8, uh, I use 0.8 because we're just dealing with nominal values here at this point. Um, and that gives us uh, an array wattage of uh, 3,894 um, watts. Now, uh, we uh, are going to continue using the uh, the Trina models, uh, the 240-watt model. Um, if we, and if we do that, it gives us uh, roughly 60 panels. Now, we also said that in our sizing uh, exercise in part two, we said that we need to be careful with how many modules we connect to each charge controller because we don't want to exceed the uh, the opacity, the output, uh, the output current that the charge controller can can put out, which is 80 amps in the case of the FM80. So, for 16 modules uh, and taking into account the efficiency of the charge controller and dividing that by the nominal voltage of the battery bank, that gives us 78 amps. Similarly, for 15 modules, it gives us uh, 73 amps. Now, because we're going to be wiring the modules here, we're going to have uh, three modules per string. Uh, the thing to do here will be to use the 150 modules here. Um, so going through that, and again, limiting uh, the input voltage at the lowest expected temperature uh, and, and making sure that we never exceed 145 or 150 volts uh, these key on the input side of the charge controller. That uh, basically takes us through these from, from the modules or we can simply use this table here that's given to us uh, in the NEC table 690.7. Uh, we basically come down to 
or temperature and then use the multiplying factor to do that. The other approach is to use the uh, given data, the published data. And if we do that, we see that our VLC will increase from uh, 37.2 to 40.7 volts at uh, minus 50. So there's quite an increase there. And since we're stringing um, three modules uh, uh, in each uh, string, since we're wiring three modules in each uh, string, uh, 40.7 times three is 126.1. So this basically tells us that we're not going to change the 150 volts in this limit. On the minimum uh, voltage end, uh, when the temperature is at its highest, we need to make sure that, again, we are able to charge, to recharge those batteries. Um, and so we need to stay above the highest charging voltage, which if we are dealing with flooded batteries, we, the highest charging voltage will be the equalizing voltage. Now, I realize that we are using AGM batteries and you don't want to, uh, you, don't, you don't want to ever equalize gel batteries or, or, uh, or AGM batteries for that matter. But we're going to continue using here our, our, uh, our HU voltage of 50 pictures for the sake of consistency, uh, but essentially we see that if we wire three modules uh, in each stream, we're going to be able to, number one, we, we, will, we will stay under the 150 volts at the lowest expected temperature, and we will be able to charge the battery at the worst possible conditions, which means the highest charging voltage and the hottest temperature. Now, going through the numbers, we see that 50 times the 240 uh, uh, rating of the uh, module is basically 3,600 uh, watts. So just again, just using nominal numbers here, um, we see that that gives us a, an output current, a charging current of 73.1 amps, which is clearly below the uh, 80 amp uh, limit. So we're okay there. Um, if we were tempted to go to 18 uh, modules, then we clearly uh, we, would run, we would run into an issue right away because we would essentially go to 87.7 8 8 amps, which clearly overloads the uh, 80 amp uh, limit. Now you can put a 100 amp breaker on the output, um, and but you have to increase the gauge of the wiring because really the function of the breaker is to protect the wiring. The controller protects itself, but you don't want to put a 100 amp power, 100 amp breaker there. You really want to stay at the 80 amp limit. So what that basically says uh, about the system is that we will need one VFX uh, 3648. We will go with three strings of the uh, Unity 2 AVR 4527 batteries, one FM controller, 15 Trina modules, uh, 240 watt uh, modules, and uh, the combiner box uh, with five circuits. We have two combiner boxes. We have one that's for um, Eight circuits and one for or eight strings and one for twelve strings, um, and of course the overturn protection devices, which I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go into. Uh, and the only thing I'll say about that is that most modules will tell you how much protection they want. Uh, for example, um, and this it's not, I'm not seeing it here, but basically you take the ISC, uh, which in this case happens to be 8.37, and multiply it times 1.25 times 1.25, and that will give us uh, the other kind of protection that we need to have uh, for each um, string. So that's essentially the, the, the recap of the sizing uh, exercise. Uh, I am putting together an Excel sheet that's going to help, uh, that's going to basically do what we just went through. Um, uh, you know, automatically. So, no need to go through uh, go through all of this in, in, in too much detail. Um, there's a lot a lot that, can, that we can cover here, and we could do just a webinar on sizing uh, sizing systems alone. Uh, and and um, uh, but I, I think that this exercise here covers the main things that we need to consider as we're sizing and designing systems. So. We said in part one that we can stack, we can combine or wire uh, our inverters in different ways. Um, here is here we have two inverters, each providing 120. So here's a 120 to 40 volt system. 
where we can power 140 volt load and 240 volt load. Uh, each inverter here has uh, is 180 degrees out of phase with each other. So it's really a three wire, uh, 140 volt uh, three wire or split phase if you're coming from a transformer system. Uh, the other option here is the parallel, where both, um, where all three inverters here are basically connected to the same phase. So all three inverters are feeding the same phase. So here we have a 120 volt uh, system, 120 volt, uh, 120 VAC with my K. Uh, the outbound stacking is essentially a combination of these two here. So here we see that we have two phases. Um, the limitation for off-grid and backup applications is up to 10 inverters. Um, so we can parallel, we, can, we could actually have 10 inverters in parallel or uh, uh, five inverters in phase or, or leg one and five on, on leg two. Uh, the transformer here is basically balancing the phases. And we'll go into, we'll go, uh, into more details with that. But uh, the three phase here, again, because uh, for off-grid systems or backup systems, we can do up to 10 inverters. And so here we can have uh, either three inverters per phase or two phases will have three inverters. And then a third, the third phase, the master phase, can have uh, up to four inverters. Now, for grid interactive systems, systems that are going to be injecting energy into the grid, there's only two things we can do at this point, and that's going to change uh, very early, uh, uh, very later this year, rather. And that's this type of stacking here and three phases. So series and, and, and three phases. Basically, we can only, we can only, you only want to have one inverter per phase. So parallel doesn't, doesn't apply or outback doesn't apply for trade and access systems. These are the voltages here that uh, we put out with our uh, uh, stacking with our combination. Uh, of inverters. So here we have our classical 120 uh, volt system with a, you know, a phase with a, with a hot and neutral. And here's our, our three wire, uh, 120 from phase A to neutral, 120 from phase B to neutral, and 240 volts between each phase with a phase angle difference of 180 here. Uh, and I'm mentioning the phase angle difference because the radian, our newest inverter, will look for not only the voltages but also the phase angle difference. If, for example, in this case here we have a, uh, a 12208 three phase system uh, with a phase angle difference of, of 120 degree, and so if we were to if we were to take two of these phases and connect it to a, to a radian. Although we might be within range of the, the AC voltage acceptance uh, with the 208, we are going to be, uh, we're not going to meet the requirements of uh, 180 uh, phase angle difference. We will be at the 120, and so the radian will not accept that voltage. And so that's, uh, I've seen that happen, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and I don't want to see anyone make that same mistake. So that's the reason I'm mentioning it. Uh, so here we have 12208. Uh, so our phase voltages are all 120, and our line voltages are all 208. Um, we, can no, we can only do Y three-phase systems. We cannot do delta uh, three-phase systems um, at this point. The easiest way to, to uh, install our gear is using these integrated systems that, that we have. This is what we call the FP1, the Flex Power 1. And if you if you go if we go back to our block diagram, which basically shows the PV array, the inverter, uh, charge controller batteries, and, and the uh, balance of systems, here we have everything essentially pre-assembled and pre-wired for you. So there's really no need to go and, and size conductors or example size breakers. It's all kind of uh, done for you, and all, all you really need to do at this point is provide the inputs and the outputs for the DC and the AC. So all you need to do is come in with your PV array wiring, with your battery wiring, with your AC loads wiring, and the, and the AC grid uh, wiring, and you're done. So really takes a lot of the work out, 
uh, out of having to assemble and install a system. If you bought these, these components separately, you'd get about 28 boxes, and you still have to assemble it and, and wire it yourself. Uh, this uh, system is already built to code, and so it's really the, the, best, way of, uh, the best approach. Uh, and it's also more cost effective. You do end up saving money if you should buy the SP1 versus uh, the components uh, separately. Sure, again, this sort of wiring uh, utility, uh, DC loads, PV, uh, PV up here, uh, going through a combiner box, and, um, and, and, and the battery bank. So the, this side here, this enclosure here, this SPLB 250, is, is uh, basically the AC side, um, and this here is the uh, DC side. Now, this comes with hub, the programming unit, which is the main. And then the um, um, battery monitoring uh, that management system, basically, which is with the FNDC is. We'll look at a picture of that later. But here's an SP2, a flex power two. Now these inverters can be connected uh, for uh, parallel operation, or for 120 for 120 volts, or for 120 to 40. Or if you had, if you had uh, a load, a single phase load that requires three-phase voltages, in other words, just two phases, uh, 122 or 8, we can also do that here. This side here is the uh, AC side, uh, AC input and output breakers. Here are the DC input breakers. Uh, both the SP1 and the SP2 are um, have an enclosure type of NEMA 1, uh, so they have to be installed indoors. Uh, that's going to be uh, changing pretty soon. With, especially with our charge controller, but here we have our programming unit. Um, so again, um, this really saves a lot of work out, uh, out of the installation where all you do is basically slap this in the wall uh, and provide your AC and DC connection. It really, really does take a lot of the work out. I've seen people reduce their, their installation times uh, dramatically by going to the uh, flex power ones and the flex power twos. Um, in addition to the flex power, we also have what we call flex wear, uh, 250, 500, and 1,000. And basically here, you would base, you would just buy the components separately and do the assembly and wiring yourself uh, if you have some special circumstance where uh, the dimensions of the FP1 or the FP2 will not work for you. Um, uh, what isn't, what is not included in the Flexware 500 is, is the charge controller. So it's basically like an FP2, you see one of these, without the charge controllers, of course. Uh, the charge controllers can be mounted here. We have brackets that will mount the charge controllers here on the side or on the top. Uh, with the 1000, uh, here we see uh, the DC enclosure on this side and the AC enclosure on this side was for the four inverters. These four inverters can again be wired for anything uh, that the application needs, 120, 120 to 40, 120 to 08. Uh, and again, the charge controllers are not included here, but um, it's, it's, uh, I've seen installations that have two or three flex where 1,000, and they just uh, reassemble themselves. Um, so. A lot of flexibility there, uh, and, and these systems are really, really easy, easy to to install. Um, I've seen people with very little or or no technical back, background, uh, basically do the installation of of Flexware 1000. Once we take them uh, through all the little steps that that we need to go through there, so very easy to install there. Now the radiance. If you remember that we said that the radiance serves both as a grid interactive unit and as a standalone unit, uh, and it looks for um, 120 to 40 volts grid phase uh, 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 network, and it puts out a continuous power of 8,000 watts with a surge capacity of close to very close to 17 kVA, um, and it can take two AC inputs, uh, grid input and a generator input, and this is where, again, this is where it's going to look for not just the voltages between the phases or and the phases to ground, but also the phase angle difference between uh, uh, phase A and phase 
B and they need to be 180 degrees, otherwise we, we just won't accept it because it's the way it's uh, constructed. The thing is stacking really only one way, which is in parallel. Uh, so here we, in this case, we have a uh, 120 to 40 volt system with all the radians being parallel. Uh, for a 24 kVA, 120 to 40 VAC, now these can be stacked up to 10 for an 80 kVA, uh, 120 to 40 volt uh, VHC system. Now, uh, let me go back here. This is the actual inverter is this section here. The uh, charge controllers are not included with it. And as far as the DC and the AC connections, we have three ways to do it. And again, what we kept in mind uh, with these enclosures was to make things easy, easy, easy for you. There's three enclosures. This is what we call the basically the empty uh, load center. It doesn't really come uh, totally empty. It does, it does come with um, some grounding bus bars, and the little bus bar here, uh, and a shunt. Uh, but, it, but please note that there are no breakers for the AC and the DC side, or the DC side. The second type of enclosure, which is essentially for systems that have AC only. So here we see that we have the AC breaker, output bypass input breakers. Here we have our terminals uh, for line one, line two. Um, here's the neutral bus bar. Please note that we are bonding the neutral bus bar to the enclosure, but we have the also provide insulation and creating boot here so that we can isolate it depending on, um, on your needs uh, for the distribution system. There are also two 175 amp breakers, uh, one for each module. Uh, and so it basically comes, and it's also pre-wired, and so it really comes uh, pre-assembled, pre-wired, so that all you do is provide your connection and you're done. All you do is just land your wiring here and you'd be done. Uh, the other one we have is for those installations that do have PV, and in fact we call this from the GFLC 175-PV, 120 to 40 volt. And please note that in addition to the AC breakers and the busing, we also provide the DC breakers. So here we have two 80 amp input breakers and one uh, basically three pole 80 amp breaker um, for up to two charge controllers. And we talked about the GFDI and its functionality and the different options we have. But here basically we have uh, we're providing the bus fault protection with one breaker, and we are also providing the uh, overload uh, protection uh, on the output of the, AC, of, of the uh, charge controller. So we have the DC wiring here, uh, the battery plus is connected here, uh, the battery negative is connected here. Please note that this has three shunts instead of just the one. And that's the, and the reason for that is become it, it, it's because it, it comes the uh, uh, GSLC one seventy five PV enclosure comes with a, with a, with an FMDC which is essentially a, bat a battery slash system monitoring system and to do that it does it through the shunt so we're measuring the currents that are the production currents the consumption currents what's coming in and out of the batteries and so forth and I'll show you a, a diagram of that in a bit later but um, here I'm showing six uh, radian units, and I'm just going to go through the steps here. This is the line, the line side uh, tap here. Uh, that's going through the distribution center that provides the uh, inputs to the uh, radian, uh, and uh, the output to the radian is also with another load center. Now, here's a transfer switch that bypasses the whole system, uh, so we can feed uh, the house loads. Now. Each breaker, each each uh, radian here, can carry uh, 50 amps. So here we have a total of of about 300 amps. So that's the capacity or the capacity, and we also need to take, you know, of course, uh, the 125 percent uh, that the load centers have to be able to handle, and that includes the the, the transfer switch. So it'd be the 300 times our safety factor there that, that we just have, have to use to size these components. But basically, 
very easy to do. Uh, here you see that uh, our, our enclosures, uh, uh, connection uh, load centers, and you just basically the bus is uh, very easy there. Um, now that's as far as installation. We're going to talk about the operation modes uh, now, uh, and and really, and the reason we're doing that is just to show you. Uh, the advantages that uh, battery-based systems can give you over just a simple grid tie system, uh, in addition to, of course, having backup with the batteries in case the grid fails. Now, the first one is the generator mode. And this one is essentially a way that uh, uh, to enable the inverter to accept uh, a low-quality uh, grid input. Um, it'll uh, actually accept the voltage uh, uh, with with some decent level of distortion and still be able to uh, do two things. It will uh, uh, pass it onto the loads, the full power of the loads, and it will charge from it. Uh, the support mode uh, basically helps the AC source, whether it's a, a grid or a generator, uh, once they get to a point where they need help. And so you, this is all totally programmable, of course, and you essentially tell the inverter when to support the AC source that's coming in with batteries so that uh, they can continue supplying uh, the loads. And so the support mode really is there to do, uh, to support the AC source uh, while still being able to charge and, and pass to, uh, out pass the energy through. Grid time mode, this, we talked about this uh, in, in part one. Um, this is essentially our, our grid interactive type application where we're injecting energy into, into the grid. Now, one thing that's unique here is that the loads have the priority. So essentially, essentially if, if the batteries are charged and all the loads are satisfied, then the excess energy then goes on to the grid. Now, uh, we still have to follow uh, the, uh, the frequency and the voltage windows that IEEE and UL want us to follow. Now, what I will say is that we've done some uh, exceptions uh, with that. In the case of Hawaii, for example, if um, they have a different requirement. The, the inverters can actually go down to 57 hertz instead of just uh, 59.3 hertz like we saw in our uh, part one um, um, of, of this webinar series. UPS mode is essentially just like itself. It, it, the inverter becomes a UPS. Now, it is true that the inverter will essentially behave like a UPS, but what this does is you have a, a response time, a transfer time of four milliseconds or less. So in a 60 hertz uh, uh, waveform, you would end up losing about a quarter of the cycle only. So very efficient, super fast transfer. And then but the only disadvantage is that it consumes a little more power uh, when you program the, uh, the, uh, the emitting in UPS mode. It, the consumption goes from 30 watts to 42 watts which is very noticeable, uh, and it has to do that because it needs to maintain certain actives, uh, certain uh, circuits active. So, very important to know that. Backup mode is uh, really the fundamental, uh, the core of, of what converter uh, technology does, where which is it senses the senses the grid went out and it kicks in automatically, and how fast it transfers from the grid to the batteries to supply the loads is, of course, totally programmable. We said that you can program it down to zero cycles or up to 240 uh, uh, cycles. So again, uh, um, very, very um, important to know that some loads are going to be very sensitive to a loss and well, other stages that we don't check. In the grid mode, uh, there's another uh, special um, um, operating mode that allows the system to um, essentially uh, provide a large battery bank, a large uh, source, but it'll allow, it'll give you more fundamental uh, modes of operation as well. 
and has a lot of advantages in terms of how you manage the energy uh, within that mini grid. So very special function, um, and uh, it, it really does make you very, very independent. And you, you can still be connected to the grid, but it'll still give you a lot of uh, uh, independency from the grid. It becomes a mini grid. Now, the offset function, this is what we talked about for grid tie systems where the loads become the priority. Um, and if we have excess uh, solar uh, coming in, even with uh, a grid presence, it will still allow the PV coming in to power the loads. And if you have excess, then the excess goes to the grid. Uh, so very, very important function. Uh, this is very, very popular in Hawaii, for example, because that's exactly what we wanted. The high battery transfer, that has to do with uh, you program the inverter through the MATE-3 uh, by telling it, I want you to use the batteries as long as they stay, as long as the batteries stay above some voltage that you program. And that basically forces the system to use the batteries. Uh, and I've seen that used in, um, in many places. Uh, there's also grid use timers where uh, the inverter will, uh, the mate will, it can be programmed to tell it, don't use the, the grid or the AC source. I want you to use the batteries uh, during these specific windows. And I've seen people use that in, for example, big shaving type applications where uh, they want to they want to uh, avoid using the uh, the grid uh, during those uh, periods because of the, the cost just skyrockets. So a very cool feature there. Now the main Three, the programming unit is uh, the the radio. The radio can program any any inverter. Uh, the radian can only be programmed with with the MATE three. The MATE three has several advantages that are very very neat. Uh, it has an SD uh, uh, slot, uh, and that that card does. It gives us a lot of different functions. But one of the neat functions that it gives us is we can use it to update of firmware in our products. Now, in the old days, you had to send us the board, and we would uh, then update the, uh, the firmware and then send it back to you. Now, that can be done on the internet by simply downloading our uh, uh, update uh, uh, firmware updates, and then you can just, just like you would update Windows, you would just keep your, your system updated. Um, the other advantage that SD card gives us is that you can let's say that you had to install 50 systems, but you needed each and every single to be programmed in the same way. So all you do is save the programming on the SD card, and then you just walk up to each site and tell uh, and, and basically tell it to program the system from the SD card, and that enables you to have uh, the same programming in all sites. Is the main uh, the main uh, screen here? It's all icon based. So let me just take you through uh, two things here: the configuration wizard, which is very very uh, easy to use. It will ask you a few things, uh, and based on the on the responses that you give it, it will go and pre-program all of the devices and the systems. So it's 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 it's, it's Essentially, what a wizard does is just it helps you with the process that you need to do, um, and um, once you use it, you, you you see the advantage of it because it really does make the whole thing go much faster, much easier uh, than having to pre-program every single uh, node or port or device, and, and it just makes the whole thing much easier to, to do. Now. We talked about this, uh, this uh, the ability to save uh, configurations from the SD card. Here are the quick windows. This is the quick summary uh, window. So if we press in the inverter here, it gives us this uh, inverter uh, status window. The same thing with the charger. The same thing with the generator. Um, same thing with the AC input. Uh, and uh, essentially uh, uh, events. And 
But the one thing it will also give us is this favorite stack here. So if you press, you can actually select four screens that we like by just uh, using the favorite uh, button. Uh, it could be a graph, it could be uh, really any screen that you like seeing. But uh, the graphs uh, in, on the main three are also very, very nice because it gives us a quick glance to the um, into the system. Um, without much effort, without really pressing any buttons. Uh, we can also set up the flexible PC from the uh, uh, Mate 3. Uh, and we'll just, again, we just need to provide it a few things. Uh, the critical thing with the FNDC is that the batteries have to be fully charged. And then we just go right through the steps and program everything in. Uh, the data logging, we can log as fast as every five seconds, or every 300 seconds, or every you know five minutes. But a lot of power here. Now, another thing it will do is it will allow you to uh, remotely monitor um, a system. So here's some data that I'll show you some data that it'll give us. So here's the, the battery charge, our battery state of charge, uh, the minimum SOC, uh, the net power to move, the net uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, how much current is going in, in, in each shunt, and I'll show you a picture of that in a bit later. Uh, minimum and maximum uh, battery voltage, but it will also give us uh, uh, information about the inverter, charge controller, uh, what we've been doing, and so So really, really helpful when it comes to monitor a system. I've seen people troubleshoot uh, systems remotely, basically from their office, uh, with this um, to make three, so it's, it, it's a really nice tool that, that just saves a lot of time. So the Plexa PC, let's just skip ahead here to what to the. Uh, here we go. So here we see uh, the multi shunt configuration, which is what we saw in the GSLP 125 um, dash PV uh, 120 to 40 volt uh, enclosure because it allows us to monitor and measure how much is coming in from our renewables, how much we're consuming uh, with our inverters, how much we're taking, well, how much is going in and out of the batteries, and as well as, of course, the battery voltage. So it really does give you a lot of information. Very powerful. It lets you know what's going on in the system, basically with a glass. The combiner boxes, we have, uh, as I said before, we have two combiner boxes. We have an eight-channel, eight-string combiner box, and we also have a 12 uh, uh, combiner box, 12-string uh, combiner box, both of which are NEMA 3R. Um, and uh, here's what they look like from the inside. Uh, very easy to use. And we have a bin rail here. I don't know if you can see it, but you can use bin rail fuses. Real, uh, uh, breakers as well, whatever you want to, whatever is appropriate for the installation. The transformer does the classical functions of stepping up and stepping down the voltage, but it also does balancing. And so in the stacking picture that we looked at earlier, we saw that there was a transformer there. And what it does is it balances the load um, in between the transformers, and, uh, and, and it helps us make sure that uh, things are balanced. We're, we're using the, the each inverter, but that we're also not overloading the neutral. So here, for example, if we had a load of 5,000 watts, mm -hmm. what the transformer does is basically make sure that each transformer, or each inverter, puts out 2,500 watts. And that allows us to keep things down. Some more pictures of what it does: you step, step up, step down, balancing uh, of the generator, um, of the faces of the generator, and then of course the output balancing. So we saw that we have uh, every time you go uh, to four inverters or more um, for upgrade or backup systems, that the transformer does. Uh, there's a really nice job of balancing things. Now, because uh, for good interactive systems, the transformer is really needed because we only have one inverter per phase anyway. So if, it's when you exceed, it's when you have more than one inverter per phase that you need the transformer to keep it balanced. 
that essentially concludes part three uh, of our webinars. We had part one, part two, part three. We're going to be posting these in our uh, website. We'll, we'll, of course, be downloading this from our website. Um, please look for a size and spreadsheet as well that we are going to be posting pretty soon. And again, my name is Ronald Paredes um, with Habak Power Systems. And thank you again for taking the time to go through uh, uh, our three webinars, part one, part two, and now part three. Um, we do have, let me post the um, content mission here for you. So we have sales support, uh, technical support, uh, and I can provide some applications engineering support. Uh, so thank you again for uh, attending our webinars. And please let us know if you have any questions. Uh, please feel free to contact us. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a nice day. Bye-bye.